So, Rob, it's so good to be with you on uh, this moment of taking a walk where we're celebrating the uh, MTV Unplugged in New York from November of 93. Now, you had an 11-year run uh, at MTV and VH1. Uh, what were you doing in particular at this time at uh, MTV? I was a lucky, lucky boy because years after programming some of America's finest rock radio stations all around the country, I got to MTV in the late 80s. And that was a time when it was still all music. And I was one of the heads of programming at MTV. So my job, along with just five other human beings, every single Monday morning was to sit in a big honking conference room where they would show us every single music video that was submitted that week. And then like Christians to the lions, we'd either do thumbs up or thumbs down. Three of us were the music programmers. We were, you know, we had those radio chops, right? And then the other three people in the room were called TAR, Talent and Artist Relations. They were there with equally great you know, music experience and programmer chops, but they were representing what the labels and the artists were interested in. And then the genius of the chairman of then Viacom, Tom Preston, was that the six of us would fight, right? Because there were only a few slots that would be added to that playlist every week. So that was that was the first part of the job. Second part of the job was that I sat in an office that had four people that worked under me and the 24 hour pages of a full day programming log would get passed up the line each day from the junior person on the staff up to me. And we would, we would literally, you know, go over every minute of every hour of everything that was on MTV. We programmed the thing like a radio station with pictures. So do you remember who was really um, at the core of the person that sort of, you know, brought this idea forward about uh, Nirvana doing this performance? <laughs> it's a great story because, you know, success has many mothers and many fathers, but there is absolutely no question if you're an intense Nirvana fan, then you need to know if you don't already about who Amy Finnerty is. Because back then, you know, remember the old days when we would go to our job and have to show up at 9 a.m., especially on a Monday? Remember those days, Buzz? Remember? Yeah. remember? Even if we, we had the coolest jobs in the world, you fucking had to go to your job and show up at nine o'clock in the morning. And, and the funniest thing about MTV back then is some of us even wore suits, which just makes you want to throw up now when you think about it. You know, remember when radio guys, like we started to wear like sport jackets and ties and we all look like idiots. Well, it, it was a little bit like that. And on many, many Monday mornings when four out of the five people that worked for me would show up the desk down at the end of the line, Amy Finnerty's desk would be empty on many, many Monday mornings. And I would look at all my guys and I would say to Kurt Steffick, one of her best buddies, one of the great programmers of MTV, where the fuck is Amy? <laughs> and Kurt would give me some sort of dog ate my homework cover like, oh, yeah, she she's out of town um, and she wanted you to know that she missed her flight. And I go, well, great. When is she going to be here? Oh, the, she, the plane, you know, I think this afternoon. Many, many weeks when Amy wasn't where she should have been at Times Square. No, we weren't even in Times Square. We were at Columbus Circle in New York back then. Amy was in Seattle. And for MTV's purposes, Amy Finnerty was busy discovering Nirvana. And when she came back on one certain week and started playing that music for the senior leadership team of MTV, the world changed. Because if you look at the context of what was happening in music, and especially what was happening at MTV, late 80s, we had a hair band phase. Early 90s, we had a boy band phase. And, you know, 
I was a little sad during the boy band phase because, you know, I thought I was working at the central, the center of the, I thought I was working at the pop culture center of the universe. And I, of course, wanted to be working at the rock and roll center of the universe. But we were a little busy for a few years playing Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch and, you know, Backstreet Boys in sync. That's what was happening a few moments before we heard Nirvana. And everyone in the world knows that that not only changed the course of rock forever, we can now say decades and decades later that that moment was the last major innovation in the story of rock. And when you listen today to Unplugged in New York with Nirvana, tell me as you reflect on that, uh, how you feel about the performance, uh, how it stands up now. Well, it's great to get the invitation to reconnect with you, especially to talk about this topic and this album, because I spent the last couple of nights listening again to that magic moment on this earth. And you can't listen to it without the agony and the pain of losing Kurt. When that happened, my office was seated next to Kurt Loder for many years. Kurt and I worked together on dozens of the MTV docs that were called rockumentaries. But when we lost Kurt not long after MTV Unplugged, Kurt was our Walter Cronkite. And this was one of the great moments in American history and world history to lose one of the true geniuses in the history of music. When you listen to Nirvana Unplugged, you're hearing the marriage of pop, rock, punk, and this ineffable section of American music that took something that was in the same breath, raw, melodic and pop <laughs> and you know if you listen to smells like teen spirit today unplugged and you think about how that could become a pop hit it almost doesn't mathematically add up in your mind except for the fact that its strength and its power is in its uniqueness and in its ability to just rip right through your soul and demand that you pay attention to something that is completely unlike anything else. I mean, I'm old enough to have spent a lot of years at CBGBs and the punk clubs in the mid and late 70s uh, in New York. This was certainly the child of that but it took it in a direction that punk could never really get to or was never designed to get to. Nirvana took it to the top of the mountain. Brilliant. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> so great to be with you again. Let's thanks. do it in person. Yeah, thanks, man.